אוקיי, first things first, תודה. מודה אני לפניך, מלך חי וקיים שהחסדת בי נשמתי בחמלה רבה אמונתך. I give thanks to you, I live in an eternal king, that in your compassion you've restored my breath. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. And I'd also like to thank Sarah, who's been amazing all along organizing this uh, amazing opportunity for us. And I want to say when Itamar and I walked in this morning, it's like I, I've never seen a place like this in my life. It's like you're showering in love and bravery and concern. So, viva la Holland. <laughs> all right. Okay, don't get carried away. All right, now listen. What I'm going to do, I've never used one of these things before, so you have to excuse me. I'm not very technically minded, but what I want to do, I want to tell you what happened to me, <clears throat> and then I'm going to tell you the <sighs> theological, psychological tools that I've employed to not only help me remain sane, but also engage with Palestinians about making uh, our society a better place. And uh, thirdly, um, I want to show you a few pictures of myself and with a couple of Arab Israelis, but also with other Palestinians. And they're not stupid selfies, you know, we're just in it. but I want you to see the genuine love and affection that I have between these people. And what I do ask uh, that you do not unlike Itamar, that you do not take photos of this. Because if, if you do, and it gets on some kind of social media, it's a death warrant. So do you all promise me? All right, so if you all promise me, we can go ahead. And then finally, when you've emptied your pockets and given all your money to Itamar, so we can carry on lobbying governments, I will play you some music. All right, but only after you go home poor. Now, <laughs> so uh, take you back uh, 10 years ago. No, 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 no. Eight years ago, uh, I was, I'm a tour guide. I've been in, living in Israel like, I don't know, 32 years. And I was guiding uh, an American Christian, Christine Lucan. And we were on the Israel National Trail. It was a Shabbat. And uh, I take her up to a viewpoint and... We're laughing and we're giggling and then suddenly I see around 20 meters down the hill, I see two men in the bushes. And uh, as I say, I've been in Israel 32 years. I can tell by the way they're dressed, they're Palestinians, they shouldn't be there. And so I tell Christine not to move, hoping they didn't see us. And one stands up and he asks in Hebrew, have you got any water? And I answered back in Hebrew, I wish, and they went away and... Uh, I was feeling nervous. I was suspecting maybe robbery. So uh, I told Christine, let's get back. I didn't want to worry her too much. So I took out my little pen knife just in case they were going to come and grab my bag. We're walking down the hill. She's behind me. I hear a scream. And as I turn around, it's like a tree gets in my back. I'm thrown to the ground. The guy's got his uh, hand on my head. He's rubbing my face in the dirt. I managed to roll over on my back. And now he's kneading, kneeling his way up me. And I want to stab him in the balls and circumcise him. But I, I managed to stab him in the thigh. And uh, I know it's a Christian conference, but the moral of that story is sometimes size does matter. Anyway, so I stab him in the thigh, but he's bigger than me. And he takes away my little knife and he hoists me up. And uh, he pulls out a machete, which I'll show you in a minute. A uh, very, very long knife and serrated. And the other man has Christine. And they're in the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful places in Israel, where the birds are singing and the pines are fragrant. And there's a gentle breeze. We're held at knife point for half an hour. And that is half an hour of terror, debilitating uncertainty. What Viktor Frankl calls the delusion of reprieve, meaning if you just obey, they're going to let you go. And after half an hour, they find my Israeli ID, and it's an old ID where we have our ethnicity, and it said Jewish. Christine hadn't spoken or anything. I'm trying to keep her calm. I'm telling her, this always happens in Israel. I mean, what, what the hell was I thinking? But 
But anyway, they find their ID and then half an hour they tell me in Hebrew, they're now, I was pretending I was a Christian tourist, uh, but they find my ID and they tell me in Hebrew, take off your shoes, they take out my laces, they tie our hands, and then they gag us with Christine's fleece, they t- take off my Star of David, and I understood that maybe they're going to push us down the hill into a car. Uh, it was the time where Gilad Shalit was in captivity. And instead of that, they separate us by a couple of meters and they push me on my knees. And then I hear, and I'm a musician, and it's like this cosmic symphony. They cry, Allah Akbar, Allah is great, I beg to differ. Christine, Christine whimpers, Jesus, help me. And behind the vomit, behind my gag, I say, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel. So the three monotheistic faiths, and they start uh, butchering, and they stab me, and I fall to the ground. I'm on my side. He leans on my leg, and I don't want to put you off your dinner, all right? But every time he, I mean, he's beating me with this machete. I can hear my bones crunch, and because it's serrated, it gets stuck in bone, and he's just pissed that he can't pull out the knife. And it's again, and it's relentless. And the only thing I know to do is to play dead. So I try not to move. And because people die with their eyes open, I kept my eyes open. And I watched the most sacred, unforgettable sight. Two meters in front of me, I watched an innocent Christian woman chopped up like a cucumber, because her executioners believed her to be Jewish. They leave only to return. One rolls me on my back, and now I'm looking up at the most beautiful sunset, and suddenly it's covered with the silhouette of a man's hand that God made, clutching a knife, and I watch him stab me in the chest, and I don't flinch, blink, or move. They believe I'm dead. They leave. I understand I have a matter of minutes to live, and I had one last commission in life, which was to die. My last thing in life that I wanted to do was die nearer where I parked the car so the police could find my body, and I managed somehow to stand. I'm still tied up and gagged, and I turn my back on what's left of my friend, and step by step, I begin to walk barefoot, gagged and bound. I can see my ribs coming out of me. I've, I've got vomit behind the, the gag. I can't breathe. I can hear my lungs bubbling. And uh, it's the most, uh, what can I tell you, the most cosmic moment. Uh, and I can tell you what I thought about. Um, I thought about God a little bit. I know he's not offended, okay? But I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to die and go to heaven. I so much wanted to live. I thought about the people I'll never hug again. I thought about the jazz music I'll never play again. I thought about looking in my friends' faces. I thought about my little doggies. I thought about all those things in life. Good scotch, a nice cigarette. I mean, it sounds crazy, right? Not if you like scotch. So I was thinking all about these things, about what made life, and that I was so sorry I'd never see this this things again. And I was thinking about things I could have told people. You know, when I say I love you, tell somebody why you love them. I'm thinking of the stupid times I shook somebody's hand instead of giving them a hug. All these things, all these missed opportunities. And my body is collapsing. But then I thought I'm not going to get any further. So I switched my thinking. And then as you do when you've nearly been murdered, I started to compose a piano arrangement of the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. You know the song? Amazing. And by the way, that was written uh, just before Hitler's Anschluss, before he annexed Austria. And it was written by the sons of two Jewish cantors. And it can be argued that that song also speaks about Jewish hope for a better world. And somehow thinking of these chords and with life just closing down and barely able to breathe, I managed to walk over a mile, nearly a kilometer and a half until I found help. Now, I want to show you just a couple of gross slides. 
Uh, if it doesn't work, please forgive me. Here we go. I feel like the place is going to blow up or something. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Ready? That's my... Can we dim the lights a little bit? I want everybody to feel sorry for me. <laughs> That's my back. That's my back. Uh, I had 13 machete lacerations. I had 30 broken bones. I had bones in my lungs and diaphragm. I had a crushed sternum, a dislocated shoulder. Um, I had a bit of a cold, an allergy, but that's not quite so important. And then uh, this is, uh, that's the one over the heart. That's seven centimeters width. <clears throat> All right. And just so you get the point, that's already me well, well improved. Now, uh, these are the knives. Yeah. And that is uh, the schmuck in the middle is Christine's murderer. And I remember what Itamar told you. This butcher, this butcher has been paid $78,000 for the execution, the slaughter of an innocent Christian lady. Now, this is the person, and I never call them animals. They're people, and that's what's so scary. All right, this is the person who tried to murder me, the one on the right. You can imagine uh, people can't help what they look like. But uh, you add the, the monstrous evil to that. It was, it was not a pleasant experience, as the British Winston Churchill liked to say about World War II. Anyway, so this is Christine, beautiful girl. And uh, I, I, you know, this one, I find this one very, very moving. You know, and don't forget, she was murdered because she was Jewish. All right. Now, on that line, um, uh, I just want you to know that when you go and work tomorrow, I mean, you, you all take a day off in the middle of the week. I think it's fantastic. But when you do go and work and you pay taxes to your government, your hard work, it is you who is funding Christine's murders and the people who tried to murder me. Those stab wounds, your money, I'm not talking about Dutch money, your money, your work is paying my would-be executioners. All right? Now, um, uh, Itamar showed you the little movie, but this is just a Hebrew document between the Israeli investigator and the prisoner. We came to kill. Kill who? Jews. Why? Eh, just because we came to kill. Is there a reason? No reason. Can I turn this off for a minute? How do I turn this thingy off? What do I do? Anybody know? Well, I, need, I don't want that. I, if I put it down, does it turn off? No, it didn't work. The red, oh, the red button. Hang on. That's okay. Look at that. I'd rather you look at me. Now, I want to, before we go back to some more pleasant pictures. Oh. Oh, it's like, it's, like being in, it's like being in the Israeli police investigation. Did you murder your friend? No, no, I didn't. It's either that or the Messiah is coming, you know. Sorry, I haven't got everything in order. Anyway, come on, Holland, settle down, settle down. Let's have some discipline. So how, how can I stand up here and joke and, and live a relatively abnormal life, all right? Um, I spent three years on my back. Now, that meant I needed, I needed help to get up. I needed help to go to the bathroom. I needed help to walk. Three years is a long time, and I'm, I'm an independent person, as you probably can tell. It was very humiliating, and I want to tell you something about the loss incurred with terrorism because we think about just physical in injury. Obviously, I've lost good health. I mean, I'm not bad for 53, all right? Just so you were – I know you were working out how old I was, so let's just clear all that up. <laughs> All right, but uh, how can, uh, what's, the, what's the losses first? And then I'll tell you the tools I've employed. Uh, it is, of course, a loss of health. It's a, it's a continuous mental trauma. It's being in constant discomfort, not so much pain anymore, but discomfort. It's, it's a loss of a friend. It's a loss of the dignity that I can provide for myself. It's the loss of routine. It's the loss of sleep. That is one thing I still haven't found. 
Uh, it's the loss of the ability. If somebody come up and they say, hey, Kay, mine and the, uh, how are you? It's the biggest question. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question anymore. So it's the loss of the ability to even say, how am I feeling? And because we were political fodder, they didn't even know our names. It's the loss of a sense of humanity. And given the fact that I have, it's not just what I saw, but being a musician, it's what I heard. I have listened to a woman plead with her executioners and whimper to her God as she's been hacked to death. That is like barging into the Holy of Holies, naked, holding a pork chop. That is like a desecration of your soul. You've seen and heard something that we were not built to hear. Put it in rather fancy terms, it's called a loss of innocence. All right, and that is irreparable. Absolutely irreparable. So the losses are hectic, but this is what I've done. All right, now you are allowed to answer this one. What is the question? Jews always ask questions, right? Just did it. Very good. So what is the question when we have unexpected suffering? What's the first question? Why? Or more specifically, why me? Well, I, I had to learn to ask the right questions. And thank goodness I had a wonderful therapist at the Hadassah Hospital. And she said to me one day, she said, look, Kay, let's be honest. You're no saint. When terrorism happens to somebody else, let's say in Syria or Indonesia, do you actually say, why them? Hand on my heart, I don't. I look at it for two seconds on the internet, think, oh, wow, that's a horrible. And then I'll scroll down to see where the next jazz music is playing. All right, I, you become desensitized to death. But I never inquire as why bad things happen to other people, meaning, does that make me so special? Do, am I like, what do you call, chasun, uh, chasina, where's the Hebrew, they've all gone, oh, that's really rude. I stayed in your sen seminar, Itamar, Itamar leaves in the middle. What's that? Anyway, but what, how do you say chasinut? No. Exemption. Like, you know, I, I, just because it's me, it doesn't mean to say, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm not that special. I'm not the center of the universe. Eh? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I won't remember it in Dutch. All right, so the question... <laughs> The question wasn't, why me is the wrong question. Uh, and you know, there's an old Jewish piece of wisdom, and I have to do the Yiddish accent, all right? When you say to heaven, heaven being a pseudonym for God, when you say to God, why me? Heaven answers, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Shit happens, all right? We were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't attribute any special messianic purpose that uh, it happened to us. And conversely, I also don't believe my survival was special. I think it was pretty cool. And I think I walked a long way and I think I was really, really brave. I do think that. But I don't, wouldn't want to see that I had special protection from God. And I tell you why, because if Christine Lucan's parents were standing with me now and somebody said, Kay, you're a miracle. Thank God that God chose to save you. I'd feel pretty uncomfortable. So I can only be thankful that I'm still alive. All right? So the dealing with the why, and I'll give you Israeli Jewish theology. I'll tell you one word. This is it. I don't know why Christians study theology. It's a waste of time. All right? Just a waste of time. Really? Where are you going to go? You're just digging your head in a hole. You don't know. So what you have to do is this. There's one Hebrew word for the question why, for the answer why, and I want you all to say it. And it sounds very Dutch because you guys also sound like you're always clearing your throat. All right? So, <laughs> just like in Israel. So, the answer to why, to every baffling, confounding problem is... Kacha. Everybody say it? Kacha. And you know what it means? No, nor me. All right. No, it actually means... It means because, just because, and we should all be comfortable with that. And I am, all right? Now, 
Another question we ask, and moving on a little bit more seriously, uh, uh, another question we ask, in fact, you know, once a we, who's we? If I can really generalize, generalize, I have lots and lots of wonderful Christian friends. I have some, obviously, being in a Jewish country, I have a lot of Jewish friends. But it was interesting to monitor the reactions of respective religious communities following the attack, generalizing, okay? But generalizing, Christians would come to me and they'd say stuff like, uh, God loves you. Or may God comfort you. Now, I'm thinking, I never thought about God. I mean, it's like, well, I don't understand what God has got to do with it. And they're asking themselves questions, where was God? Well, I, I didn't see or hear God, loosely speaking. God was in that fragrant pines. It was, it was in that beautiful sunset. All right? It's like he was in the birds. I mean, if I'm going to blame God for murder, I have to blame him and I have to accuse him for that sunset if I'm going to absolutely point the finger at him for evil I also have to accuse him for good I can't have my cake and eat it too so the idea was where was God it was like well where was God he was there God didn't do this man did this and the question, the first question in the Hebrew Bible is what we need to ask, ask ourselves. And what's the first question in Hebrew? Yefemod, ayeka. When God comes down and he's looking for Adam and Eve who have really screwed up, and he says, Adam, meaning humanity, mankind, it's rhetorical. Where are you? What have you become? And when I was in court and I looked at these murderers who sniggered and they smirked and they yawned and they said they'd do it again, I didn't say, where was God? I thought to myself, how can two men who were once little boys grow up and hold a machete in one hand, a Marlboro in the other, and hack at two innocent women without blinking an eye? And I'll answer that question. How can they do it? They do it because of the pay to slay, exactly what Itamar talked about, and they do it because of the incitement. So where was God is irrelevant. It's where is man, and what are we doing about it? Now, the, the, so, but the Jewish response, and it was the only thing that actually made me feel a little alive. I mean, I'd be laying on somebody else's sofa and like lights on. I'd have noise and people I had so many visitors from all communities. And it's really funny. You know, I'm busy dying and Jews walk in with food like I need food, you know, but like trays of food, trays of food. It's like, good God, get that away from me. I can't even stand the smell. So they bring in food and then they're talking about, you know, what's in the recipe. And then they sit, notice me, you know, expiring on the sofa and then they lean over and they say, may God avenge her blood. And I thought, my people, that's what I want. I want divine vengeance. And I want to be a tool where I can be used with Itamar to bring about justice. Justice, which means that these people who are not worthy to be in society stay in prison for the rest of their lives and they don't get another shekel for it. So it was kind of a eureka moment for me in the court. But I have to be honest, the hate ran deep. I mean, I behaved very well, which is astonishing, really, because I've got quite a temper on me. Uh, I know you don't believe that, do you? But anyway, I, <laughs> I was looking at these and the Israeli court system. It's very weird. I mean, they're very, it's a very small room. It's like, I mean, tiny, like just the size of this. I don't know the meters, but opposite me, five meters opposite me sat these two people, these two murderers. And uh, I tell you then, I had to sit on my hands. Because if I had had a knife, I would have gouged out their eyes and stamped on their eyeballs. And uh, uh, two things about that. Uh, I want to be very, very clear, and it might be a little edgy for some people. I hate them. I can't hate them enough. All right? 
Now, that doesn't mean to say that now, seven years later, I'm sitting there hating them. I feel neutral to them. But I believe it's our moral duty to hate evil. And just to be really clear, okay, because I'm going to show you some slides with myself and Ali and all kinds of uh, wonderful Palestinians and Muslims. Uh, what's enabled me to have relationships with these people is to separate. You know, in the Bible, we say it every morning in our Jewish prayers, we distinguish between night and day. We distinguish between the Shabbat and the other days. We actually do distinguish between man and woman. Okay, we, dist we make these distinctions. And we have to, I believe, uh, you can do what you want, but I know what's kept me sane. I had to make a moral distinction between those who did the deed and those who were innocent. And I hold accountable the two savages. I hold accountable the Palestinian Authority. And I hold accountable the Dutch government for paying these people for my attempted murder. And I hate them for that. I think it's absolutely obscene. And when I go to The Hague tomorrow with Itamar, I'm going to tell them that. Because you only live once. So I don't forgive. All right? I do not forgive. And it's this, this decision not to forgive which has set me free to actually love. All right, and that's, I, it's a very, very difficult concept to communicate to particularly non-Jewish audiences. But uh, I want to show you, will it work again? <laughs> I want to show you now a little bit of uh, this stuff, you know, me and some Arabs, because I want to leave you with some hope. You know, it's like, and I believe we can all do our part. We can all walk one step at a time, like my walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We can do stuff to make our society safer. Okay, so this, this is, uh, this is um, oh, I love the one on the right, uh, the left, the left. <laughs> what a cutie, what a cutie. I want to show you, this is just simply the relationship I had, uh, the friendship I had before the attack. There's, you'll see some Israeli Arabs friendships I had, and then you'll see new ones. This is my bus driver. All right, now what I, why am I doing this? Because I was a tour guide, and I'm going to give them all, no photos, I'm going to give them all Dutch names, because you won't remember all these Arabic names. So this is Jan, all right? <laughs> this is Jan, and I, I had a very close relationship. And Jan is so funny, he comes to the hospital. He comes to the hospital, and he came with his brother, and he came with his wife, and he, he came in moaning. Honestly, I was on death door. And he, the first thing he says, he says, I have to be quick. I parked the bus in the wrong place. <laughs> All right? Thank you, Jan. So, uh, but we had a very lovely relationship. Oh, hang on a minute. That's my dog. I, well, yes, my late dog. Anyway, so uh, we used to go around touring with the dog, and we were a very, very good team. Um, and that's him. Uh, uh, it's really weird. He's an Arab, but he can't stand Arabs. It's a kind of schizophrenia. So there he is looking towards Syria. And we only argue about one thing. We argue passionately about politics. He says, I'm far too left wing. All right, go figure. Now, so that's Jan. Uh, this one is interesting, uh, a bit blurred. This lady was actually, she's a Muslim uh, from uh, the eastern side of Jerusalem. Uh, she was the translator in Arabic in the court, and she wept in court, and she couldn't carry on with her job because she was so sickened with them. And she came up to me and she said, I'm so sorry, and she wouldn't stop crying. And uh, she gave me a phone number. I called her a few weeks later, and it was coming up to Passover. And she says, I want to invite you to Passover. And I said, but you're a Muslim. You do Passover? And she says, no, but you can teach me how. So uh, I said, look, I don't even cook. All I know is no bread and no beer. Sadly, no beer, but I can bring the wine. And so she made me this lovely vine leaves, and I spent uh, one of the days in the Passover with her family. So uh, now this is another young man on the left. Uh, I knew him before. He, he lives in Bethlehem. We will call him Thomas. 
All right? Of course it's Thomas. And Thomas was a shop owner, is a shop owner. And we used to have really healthy discussions. And he always had a problem with the security barrier, which in some places isn't. And in some places, it's a wall. Uh, but a very, very uh, good guy, some lovely kids. And uh, one day I tell him, this is about 10 years ago, I say, look, you know what? You have a permit to come to Israel. We'll, we'll squeeze all of you in my little car. And I want to take you to a little play area, kibbutz. So I'm under there somewhere as well, by the way. But uh, so I take this Thomas to this kibbutz. And when he walks in, look at his face. He's like, he can't believe that children have such facilities. And it was like a eureka moment for him. Like, where is all the money, the billions that are going to the Palestinian Authority? He couldn't get over it. And then the attack happened. He's beside himself. He doesn't know what to do. And then a few years later, he started realizing that there was no wall where we were hiking. If there'd have been a wall, maybe Christine would have been alive today. And he was very sorry that he'd been bigoted and he'd, he'd messed up and he'd had these opinions that weren't true. And he said he was in Bethlehem. He came across this uh, so-called Palestinian NGO, which, by the way, there's 3,200 in them in the whole of the Judea and Samaria and Gaza. They've all got their fancy four by fours and their fat salaries and they do f nothing. And uh, so what you have there, sorry, I nearly dropped the F-bomb. But uh, so anyway, uh, Christian conference, I must keep. Clear. So anyway, he saw this, he saw this, uh, this graffiti. He saw this graffiti on one of these NGOs and it said, peace to all except Israel. And he says, Kay, I want to help you. I said, well, what are we going to do? I'm not even allowed in there. And he says, let's vandalize it, a message of peace. And I thought, what a great idea. So it was about a church who supported, uh, they put a wall in London and like they didn't think about my friend. So uh, Thomas drove up in his car. He gave me a can of spray spray. Uh, spray paint, and I sprayed St. James, no to jihad, justice for Christians, Israel, and all people. And then we got in the car and drove off. <laughs> and then he said, he said, he said, no, we need a selfie. We need to get you, have a picture. <laughs> so we found this Palestinian policeman, and I played the Christian tourist, and we had a lovely selfie. Now, <laughs> So that, that, was, that was kind of funny. And then uh, let's go back two years, two years ago. I started writing, blogging, uh, and uh, it turns out I actually can write well. And I surprised myself. I even won a couple of awards. I mean, I can't cook. I can't do admin. Fashion, I have no sense, but I know how to write and I can play the piano. So uh, this is very interesting uh, because uh, I started ghostwriting for uh, Orthodox Greek priest in Israel. Now that's not him, that's him. <laughs> All right, uh, this is Father Nadaf. Now Father Nadaf is a very brave man. He understood that although we call them Arab Christians, they're not Arabs. That's because they've had the, the prehistoric and barbaric system of Islam, which is what it is, put upon them and they've become Arabized, but they actually go back to the Aramean people. Okay, and I'm a tour guide and you can argue with me that later. So I started writing, ghost writing as a Christian priest. And he also picked up a couple of awards. And what did he do? He wanted to help the Arabic speaking Christians identify with their Jewish brethren, to see themselves as, as coming from a Judaic culture so that they would then enlist into the IDF and they'd find a home amongst Jews. And it was quite successful. He had a good... Uh, Good, uh, how do you call it, increase. And so uh, it, when I said, he said, look, Kay, we have to pose nicely for the photo. I'm an Orthodox Christian priest, so I'm trying to look all serious. <laughs> and then we, uh, start, we got into his own private office and we were just laughing our heads off. I mean, he's picking up all the money, all the awards, and I'm just like, nothing. Anyway, so <laughs> after, after, when was it? Do you remember the kidnapping of the three young Jewish boys? Now, when that happened in 2014, uh, there was a young Israeli Arab man, a teenager, uh, and this is his real name because it's been published, Muhammad Zouabi. And Muhammad, being a boy and a teenager, he identified with the kidnapping of the teenagers, who it still wasn't found out that they'd been murdered. 
So he uploaded, like boys do, onto YouTube, and he said in Hebrew, Arabic, and uh, English, bring back our boys. Now, as a result of that, uh, there was death threats from Muslims on this kid's life. So I texted him on the Facebook because I saw he was getting a bit carried away, you know, like, and I said, Muhammad, you're not a hero. You just did the right thing. That's all. But you're getting too big for your boots. This is not a joke. If you need help, this is my number. He called me that night and he says, I'm hiding in a hole. I said, okay, where are you? I was in the desert, living in the desert. He says, oh, I'm up by the Lebanese border. I thought, you little rat. So I drive all the way up to the Lebanese border. <laughs> Okay, I pick up this kid, there he is, and uh, actually with the help of uh, my Christian Taurus, it wasn't safe for Muhammad to be in Israel and continue his education. Uh, we found financing, he went to Florida to continue his education, and of course when it came back, when he came back it was safe, the news broke out. Uh, Jewish survivor of terror helps Muslim uh, Arab kid. All right. Now that was critical. All right. And I tell you why it was critical. That's my dog. You'll see a theme underneath my dog is Muhammad. All right. Uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, and you're going to see a theme of dogs. Now, uh, Muhammad was the first. And then a few months later, there's another Arab kid. That dog is so greedy. I'm dis I, it's disgusting. It's like, I do feed her. All right. I do feed her. But, uh, this is, his name has also been published. This is Yahya Mohammed. And Yahya was 18 years old. And he uh, comes from this city. It's not a village. When we talk about Arab villages, it's so quaint. But when you have like 35,000 people, I, I think that's a city. Comes from a place called Um al Fahum in the north. And the uh, municipal council, they had an ISIS flag. And so Yahya, being Yahya and being a boy, goes and destroys it, and then he posts it on, on the Facebook. And they want to kill him, so I get another phone call. And so I go up there, and I grab the guy, and he stays with me, and it's been a very, very special relationship. And uh, that's me and Muhammad and Yahya having a very nice time. And then, listen, this is very moving. Uh, Muhammad on the left, Yahya on your, hang on, is that right? Right. This is actually at Christine. Christine was buried in America, but she worked for the Anglican Church in Jerusalem. Uh, they had a little garden, and these two young men came to her memorial. And uh, one of them read the Hebrew prayer, the mourner's prayer, the Kaddish. And the other, a Muslim, read the Our Father who art in heaven. So it was really amazing. And they dragged this other Israeli kid. They met him on the street, and he was very happy to see me. So I said, Put your money where your mouth is, come to the memorial. So it was all very good. And uh, last week, uh, Yahya on the right, this is what happened. That's his mother. Uh, he, he's in Nahal Regiment and he got his green beret in the army. Uh, so it was a big celebration. I love that picture. Absolutely love that picture. And there's mummy. She's really, really happy. She got so many hugs. Um, moving on uh, briefly. This is me having a tattoo. You remember the prayer I said in the beginning? I give thanks to you, O living and eternal king. I have that around my wrist in Hebrew. Uh, there's a group called Artists for Israel. They wanted to tattoo survivors of terrorism. And some people, it was very moving. They had the signature of their dead kids. And I thought, I want a prayer of thanks. But I want an Arab to tattoo me with a Jewish prayer. So I, I didn't exactly go around the street saying, Muhammad, can you do a tattoo? It wasn't like that, all right? But I found this Arab guy, and uh, you talk about irony. He's tattooing me after I've been massacred nearly with a machete, and he says, I'm so sorry, I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> anyway, so that's just afterwards. Uh, that was pretty good. Now, moving right along, okay, uh, a Christian young man who we shall call Vincent. You like the Dutch names? All right. Vincent is the one sitting down holding the whatever that is, a cup. And Vincent was from Gaza, is from Gaza. And Vincent contacted me also on social media and he said, Kay, I'm, I'm a Palestinian Christian. I've just moved to Bethlehem. I'm so sorry about what happened to your friend. And I said, thank you. Are you also sorry about what happened to me? <laughs> no, it's uh, interesting. And he, and he said, of course. So we, we came to meet. 
And I, I mustn't get into trouble, so don't make me say any names, especially if it's recorded. But he had this, he told me his experience with God, and he'd just become like a real Christian, and he wanted to study the Bible. So he enrolls in a Bible college in Bethlehem. And uh, there's he, he says he can't read the Bible enough, it's so interesting. And then at the college, they're, to, they're teaching replacement theology and liberation theology. And he'd call me, the Jew, and say, is this right? Did Jesus of Nazareth? I said, no, Jesus was an Orthodox Jew. Really. It's, it was a, you know, the context of uh, Judaism of that day. And we became very close. And uh, uh, he, a fantastic young man. He says, I'll do anything for you. You're an amazing person and all this. So he had his birthday. And I said, what do you want for your birthday? And he says, I want to meet settlers, uh, which really it literally means Jewish people living in Judea and Samaria. Okay, it's not a pejorative. So here you have these radical right-wing Jews. It's a joke. <laughs> That's like Itamar. Itamar is one of those hardcore Jews, all right, <laughs> living in the occupied territories. And so he brought his little friend along. And what do you think he does? That's just that he's telling the story, uh, his story, and he's just saying how much he says, Jesus made me love Israel, which we all cried at, honestly. It was quite beautiful. And we asked, what do you want? He says, I want a Bible. I want a Hebrew Bible with rabbi's commentary. He says, I don't want to read about Calvin and Luther. I want to know what Rashi said. So the guy is now studying Hebraic text, which is pretty cool. And uh, the, uh, sorry, the alcohol appears a lot in these slides. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, so we made him a cake with a Hebrew message. And uh, there was a moment where I gave him that knife. And he says to me, he says, Kay, do you trust me? <laughs> and that's the hug. I think that's the most beautiful picture. Uh, now, recently, uh, I had the privilege of speaking once more. I hate this name, Settlers. We have to find another word, but just because time is getting short. I gave my, I gave my uh, story, told my story to Jewish people and also Arabs I hadn't met. Um, this guy, you see the guy on the left? They were thrilled. There's also five other Palestinians there who are hiding. And Itamar mentioned normalization with uh, Israelis is very dangerous. There was one young man, we were talking about music, wonderful young guy. He plays the oud, you know, this like me me Middle Eastern guitar. They found out, the Palestinian Authority found out he was with us. They went into his house and they smashed up all his musical instruments. Uh, but the guy on the left, Really, and then when I, I mean, I think it's perfect because in the Q&A, one of them, the one on the left, he says, you know, but it's occupation. And the thing is, I have to be honest with them. I say, look, guys, you have no history here. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> All right. If you were, if you held your own authority accountable, you wouldn't be in this situation. Don't give me all your victimhood bullshit. All right. I'd rather have a checkpoint than being stabbed 13 times. So let's put everything into perspective. And when you're honest with them, all right, this guy, let me call him, what, Lucas. Let's, no, let's call him Johan. Johan, I said, because you know in Islamic culture it's haram to drink wine. So I said, come and meet the dog and get drunk. So he came over <laughs> and we're all having a really good time. Uh, now this one, this is Lucas, fine young man. Uh, also, somebody who contacted me, really, really respectable young man. And he, it, you know what Purim is, right? One of the Jewish festivals where we all dress up. And some of my friends in the settlement wanted to meet this guy, Lucas. And Lucas was, he, he was so much wanted to come into this settlement. But in Jewish festivals, there's always extra security. Now, I know that Lucas is kosher. But the people in the settlement, there's the guards, you know, you can't, I didn't want to impinge upon them. And I wanted to get, <coughs> excuse me, Lucas to the party, all right, but not to make life hard for the, the security. So I said, but it's pouring, we dress up. You simply dress up and we go through the border. And then I thought, if I put a clown's hat on him, I mean, he looks, look, he looks Arab, yeah? I mean, that's not a bad thing. And then I had this great idea. I know what I can dress you up like. A terrorist. <laughs> <coughs> so we got in the, we went to the pouring party and uh, <coughs> the most amazing thing is, uh, just two weeks ago, Itamar mentioned this, 
uh, he asked me to guide him around the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, and he wept from the beginning to the end. Now, uh, this, the little touch on the project that Ali was talking about, this is, uh, we managed, you know, I basically went and threatened people if they didn't give $10 here, $10 there, to, so we could do some renovations. That bottom floor is the apartment we've rented for our after-school club. I mean, really, these people should be ashamed of themselves. And what you need to know in these so-called neighborhoods, camps, really ridiculous, uh, there's lots of four by four vehicles. Some of these people live very well, but we want to teach them responsibility because you are talking about the lives of children. And Itamar also said it, they are victims of their own uh, wicked authority. So there we are, this is before the renovations. All right, it's all very exciting. I mean, look, it's pretty rough, looks like. But we renovated, we got a bit of money and we painted it, all right, making some classrooms, making things sticky on the walls, ABC, all very exciting. And I had him in my uh, house for a Shabbat meal. And so that uh, would be the last slide that I want to show you. So what I want to do, can we turn this thing off again? Oh, gosh, is because uh, <clears throat> I know time has uh, run out. I do tend to go on, but uh, I want to uh, finish by just playing you the arrangements I thought about over the rainbow, okay, because it does talk about Jewish hope for a better world. And all joking aside, all joking aside, uh, yes, I'm brave, but uh, uh, there's another very brave man here, and that would be Itamar. Itamar is one of the only people, his organization, that is singled out, mentioned by the Palestinian Authority. He's at the end of the <laughs> rifle. And uh, without Itamar, without Itamar's, these people sit in his office day and night going through Arabic material. And I, I just wanted to use that, um, this opportunity. He's a very humble man, but really to thank him because he's on the forefront. Everything else that you see coming from, you know, people exposing media comes from Itamar and his organization. So I really, um, as I said, I, I, you promised me that if you, if you help Itamar out, you can hear some music. Who's going to help Itamar out? Good, Harlan. So now I'm going to play you the music. All right. Everybody give some thinking. I haven't practiced for like a few uh, months, but uh, let's see what happens. So take some time. Thank you, Holland. You've been amazing.